Why is it that we hate growing old so much? Some people say they don't, but I don't know that I believe that. I hate I hate the, the effects of getting old. I hate uh, the weaknesses in my body. I hate the, the signs of age. I hate the inability to not do what I did when I was younger. I hate it. I hate it all. I hate it when you see loved ones die. Why is it that we hate that? Because we were never built. We were never created to experience aging, sickness, or death. So when Jesus said he came to redeem us, he didn't just mean to forgive us of our sins and get our sorry hides into heaven. He meant, look it up, redemption, redeemer. It means to bring everything back to its original uh, state. Well, God's original state for mankind was for us to never die, never grow weak, never grow old. None of that. Why do you think the Bible says he's coming for a church, a bride without spot or wrinkle? Do you think that's just uh, an analogy for sin? If that's the case, then, um, you know, then then why would he even say it? Because if you're born again, your your sin has been delivered. He's not, that's the, that's everybody, but not everybody's the bride. Who's he coming back for? The ones without spot or wrinkle. He's not just talking about sin. He's talking about, he's coming back for a bride that isn't an old haggard looking thing. He's coming back for a bride that is a, uh, that is glorious. He said he's coming for a church that is glorious. All right. That means <laughs> that means exactly what it says. And when it says without spot or wrinkle, I believe with all my heart. And I'm going to prove to you through the word if you'll hang on with me because we could go on this for a while because this is something God has been teaching me for 10 years now. And I can prove it all through scripture that one of the things he meant when he said without spot or wrinkle is what is what is the first signs of aging? Spots and wrinkles, y'all. In other words, he, he's saying to us, he's giving us a clue. When I come back for my bride, you're going to be made youthful. And it's not just youthful. We're going to be fulfilling back to what we were created to be before Adam and Eve sinned. Now, uh, what do I want to bank that on? I want, well, it's a lot of places. What about Psalm uh, 103? He said he'll satisfy your mouth with good and renew your youth like eagles. Why is he talking about renewing our youth if he's not going to do it? God doesn't ever just spit words out there in a poetic thing that doesn't mean what he says. He means what he says. And he is the redeemer. So once he has accepted that title, that name for himself, he has to fulfill that title or the devil can say, bow your knee to me because I'm the father of all liars and you just lied. You just said something you couldn't pull off. I'm telling you what is too big for God. What is too big for God? And um, in Romans chapter 8, I love this chapter. It's just full of the mysteries of the future uh, purposes and plans in the heart and the mind of God. I'm telling you, he loves us so much. He wants to redeem us and restore us spirit, soul, and body, including our bodies. Our bodies are included in salvation. The word sozo means completely. It's, it's everything. And that includes our bodies. But in Romans chapter 8, verse 2, it says, The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. Not going to make me free. Already has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, we believe that we have been redeemed from the law of, of, of sin. I mean, we don't think we have to do the 600 and some odd commandments and stuff like that to deal with the sin in our lives. No, uh, we've been freed from that. Then why don't we take the second part of that verse, that we have been freed from the law of sin and death. Why do we honor death? And we say this, you know, there's only two things that you have to do in life, and it's take, it's uh, death and taxes well uh, I, I I don't I, I'm not buying that the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die not twice once okay well the Bible lets us know clearly that when we got born again that when Jesus died we died with him 
We, he, he, he took our, he took us into his death, burial, and resurrection. I've already died. And, and the whole call of the Lord Jesus Christ is to die. Uh, and, and you know what? When the Lord calls us to come into salvation, you know, people say, well, it calls to give you a better life. Yes, he does. But he actually, he actually calls you to come and die. And then I heard one guy saying God created marriage so that he could speed up the process of dying. <laughs> I think that's kind of true. But anyway, he called us. And, and you know, Jesus himself said, except a corn, a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. And if you seek to save your life, you will lose it. But if you'll lose your life, you'll save it. What is he saying? He's saying, if I, if I am fully 100% Wanting everything that God's got for me in my life. And I am willing to die to the old, to walk in the new, that I don't have to physically die. There's been, there's, there's people that's not physically died before. I mean, Enoch was the first. Elijah was the second. Jesus died and then rose again to prove that we will rise again. Well, anyway, out of Romans chapter 8, verse 23. Listen to this. Okay, listen to it. Really listen to it. All right, this is great news, y'all. Don't, don't, don't let our small mindset keep what God is wanting to say to us walled out. Okay, uh, Romans 8, 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which well, let me back up. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together uh, until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Ephesians 1 says that we have the first fruits. What's the first fruits? It's, it's, uh, and it says we have the, uh, it's basically like the down payment, the, um, uh, where, where we pay, what do you call it? Uh, you pay down payment money for something. Oh shoot, now I gotta go there because I lost the words. Um, hang on. I don't want to start this thing all over again. Which is the earnest, that's the word I wanted. The earnest of our salvation. We have received the earnest, which is the down payment, okay? What, the earnest is money that you lay down. You don't, it's not the whole, it's not the whole price tag. Like you put down earnest money when you buy land. If you're off on the road someplace and I see a horse that I want to buy, but I don't have all the money there, I put down earnest money for that horse. And what does that say? That says I have all the money and I'm coming back. To get this animal. This animal's mine. I don't want anybody buying it out from under me. Well, Jesus, when Ephesians 1.14 says, the which we have received, well, 1.13, in whom we also trusted after that we heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, to whom also after that we believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Sealed. In other words, I'm buying you. And ain't nobody can take you out of my hands. Doesn't the Bible say nobody can take you out of his hands? You're mine, and I'm coming back for you. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So when we got born again, all we he paid the full price, but all we're walking in right now is the earnest of it, the down payment. What's that? The 10%, y'all. And they even say, even science backs this up. They say that at best we're only using 10% of our brain and our, our faculties are only operating at a very low degree, even at birth, that we're not operating in 100% of what our bodies are capable of doing. I'll say, going back to Romans chapter 8. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, they're born again. We're operating in the first fruits, the, the down payment. Uh, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption. And it says to wit, or in other words, the redemption of our bodies. Now we say, and, and this is, it. I mean, it's no big deal. It still flies, but. It's not exactly what God meant. We say when you're in the, you're in the Christ, you're adopted into the body of Christ. No, I'm not. 
I'm not, I have, my daddy, when, my maiden name was Mangold. I got my daddy's name, not because I was adopted, but because his DNA was in me. When you're born again, you've got the DNA of the blood of Jesus in you. You are not adopted. You are a blood-bought son or daughter. So what is he talking about adoption? And you know what? If you look up that word, adoption, it literally means to be placed in a position. And so we're born again. We're we're sons and daughters of the Most High God. But he says, waiting for. This is Paul who is writing this. And he's born again, spirit-filled, operating in miracles, revelation knowledge, going off and, and having exploration times with the Lord. You know, I, was, I don't know if I was in my body or out of my body, but I went into the heavenlies and I did this and that. He is, he is, he is. Operating in so much of what is our rights to operate in. And yet he says, waiting for the adoption. He's born again. He's not waiting to get saved. What is he waiting for? The adoption or to wit it in King James it says, or in other words, the redemption of our bodies. So the fullness of salvation, the adoption of the Lord Jesus Christ that he's talking about is when our salvation isn't just operating in my spirit. My spirit man got born again the moment I made Jesus my Lord, the moment I invited him in and he became and I, I said, God, I want you in me. I want I want you to own me. I want you to possess me. I am yours. My my spirit got born again. But my soul, my mind, my will, my emotions, they still get they still got to be trained and dealt with and refined and redeemed and worked on by the word of God and all of that. I can still think ugly and still talk ugly and 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 all of that But then. Then when my soul starts accepting everything that God says about me, when my mind, my will, my emotions get in line with the word of God, then what happens? My body will fall into suit. And it, when Jesus saved us, he saved us spirit, soul, and body. You agree, right? That's why, obviously, when, when people die and go to heaven, they get new bodies, and their bodies are beautiful and youthful and all of this. But that isn't the fullness of what God wants to do uh, because he wants heaven to come into the earth. So he said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth. And guess what? Not only that's not only on earth, that's in earth. What is my body made out of? It's made out of earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth. The will of God is not for my body to die. The will of God is not for my body to be sick. So he wants to have his will not only in my spirit, in my soul, but in earth as it is in heaven, in the in, in the earth of my body as well as in the planet earth. Okay? So I just okay, let's just this is just giving you entrance level right here. But let me go to something else. I can this can be proven all over the Word of God. It's so cool. The problem is it's hard to believe because we have never seen anyone who have who has had their youth renewed totally. It's never been seen yet on planet Earth. Uh, I, I know I've heard of people who haven't aged in in decades and all of that because they believed it. And um, uh, uh, well, what was his name? Taylor. Uh, shoot, I. All of a sudden, can't think of his name. Anyway, before he passed away, I think he was in his 80s or 90s, and he started looking uh, younger, and uh, uh, he looked like he was in his 60s. But you don't see that very much. But the thing is, we're seeing we're seeing evidences of it, like like when you're getting a, a you know tiny raindrops, but you're looking for the flood. You know, God wants in 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 first Corinthians chapter two, he says, I has never seen nor has ear heard. Neither has it even entered into the heart of uh, not even entered in your imagination what I'm about to do. So God is going to do some things that has never been seen on planet Earth before. So open up to new things. Don't let religion cause you to go, oh, oh, no, we, we, you know, uh uh-uh, I've never seen that before. So, no, he wants to do a new thing. Isaiah 43, 18 says he's going to do a new thing. All right. 
But let's base this on a foundational principle, all right? At, uh, Abraham and Sarah are, are or were our covenant heads. They are the covenant heads for the gospel because before God could bring his son into the earth uh, with by a supernatural birth, he had to have a couple that would believe for a supernatural birth. Uh, he had to have, before he could offer up his son, because God, see, he gave the earth over to man for 6,000 years to do as he wanted with the earth. And man just blew off God and did his own thing. So God's on the outside looking in. So what has he got to do? He has to legally do this through mankind or, or the devil could say, hey, you're jumping over your boundaries. You said this was man's uh, earth for 6,000 years and you're interrupting from the outside. So God had to find a man who was so obedient to him that he was willing to give his own son. And when you look at it, you realize that Isaac was not a child. It says a boy and a child, but they called them children. I mean, they didn't even believe they were capable of speaking and teaching until they were like 80. And uh, he, he was, they say, I don't know, but they say he was in his 30s, you know, probably th around 33. So Abraham was old and Isaac was a young man. And so he had to find a man who would, Obey God so much, love God so much so that he was willing to lay down the life of his son and he had to find a son in the earth that was so obedient to his father that he would lay his life down in obedience to his father. And it had to be a miraculous birth. They had to believe for a miraculous birth. All of that. They're the, there are covenant heads. So because Abraham and Sarah, uh, obeyed these things, God could bring his covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ into the earth. Uh, and so let's look at Abraham and Sarah in chapter, uh, Oh, what is it? Uh, 17, I think, of uh, Genesis. Uh, yeah, God came and he was talking to Abraham and he cut a covenant with him. And in verse 21, though, it says, But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto you at this set time in the next year. Okay, in a year from now, Sarah's going to bear a child. Well, you look over here in verse eight, uh, chapter 18, verse 11. It says, Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. And it had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. All right. They were old and stricken. I looked up that word stricken. <laughs> it means besieged. It means like, okay, the castle is surrounded and you can't escape. I mean, they were old. All right. But two chapters later, over here in chapter 20, Abraham journeyed from there and uh, he journeyed into Gerar or something like that. And, uh, and it says um, that Abimelech, Abimelech, I got to check something right here. Uh, Abimelech uh, saw Sarah and wanted her to be one of his wives. Okay, now she two chapters ago she was well stricken in age and 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 didn't have her menstrual cycle anymore and and God said in one year's time you're going to have a child. Okay, so what that tells me is nine months of that one year leaves three months. I mean, kind of. I got. I'm I'm like so good with math here. Uh, so that meant. In within three months of the time that God talked to them and said, a year from now, you're going to have a son. He was going to have to renew their youth. He had to renew their youth. Now, you got to understand this. They are our covenant heads. Everything that God does in the covenant heads or through the covenant heads is just a blueprint, a type and a shadow of what he will fully do at the fullness of that covenant. Do you understand what I'm saying? Then all of a sudden, within a three-month time, God reversed 
the aging process in their bodies. He totally restored them to where within a few months time, because it was before she was pregnant. Before she got pregnant with Abraham, Abimelech wanted her and God had to get her out of that situation because Isaac was to be born. She couldn't have sex with anybody else but Abraham. So within a three month period, they turned from being old and shriveled up to gorgeous and youthful again. And and Abimelech wanted her and then God rescued her out of that and she had a child. She had Isaac one year later. Okay, they're the covenant heads. Everything that the covenant heads go through and get is a type and a shadow of what the covenant will fully bring forth in its fullness, in the full term of, of that covenant. This is the beginning of the covenant. At the end of the covenant, it is the fullness of everything that is a blueprint in the beginning. So that tells you right there that Abraham and Sarah are covenant heads. So what God did for them, he must do, not must, because he he's going to do. It's done. It's what he wants to do at the fullness of that covenant. He, he So it's a restoring of our youth. It, when in the in the book of uh, Joel, where it says he will restore the years that the locust and the canker worm have eaten, he he didn't say that he'll restore the things that the locust and the canker worm have eaten. He said, "I'll restore the years." There's something about this that God is going to remove the curse out of time. I don't know how to say it or how He's going to do it, but I'm telling you, it's God's word, and it has to come to pass and I'm excited about it now let's look at something else I want to go back to Romans all right this is so cool I love Romans because it's just so it's so full of things that we're just discovering all right I I heard about the the experience that uh, John Paul Jackson had with the Lord John Paul Jackson went on to be with the Lord uh, and died a few years ago, but he had a major, major experience where he was taken bodily into the throne room of God, and God, of course, shielded him to where he could stand it, but it was heavy, heavy, heavy. It was a massive experience, and took him in, and, uh, and an angel spoke to him and told John Paul Jackson in this experience that at the end of of days that are well not I mean not, he didn't say at the end of the days but in our time all right at, beyond John Paul Jackson's age he said that God was going to open up a revelation that had not yet been seen out of Romans chapter 4 all right well I list I heard about this and and uh, Justin Paul Abraham was talking about it and he said he went through Romans chapter 4 and went through it and he began he believed that uh, from the 17th verse on down is what is what the angel was referring to and after I read it I do too because let me tell you uh, 10 10 years ago over 10 years ago God I was just studying the word and all of a sudden God swept over me and put me into an experience with him and he began to tell me and reveal to me about the renewing of youth and the restoration of our bodies which I didn't know anything about never heard anything about it and didn't believe it thought we all had to die unless you were caught up in the rapture but the rapture is connected to this but anyway uh, for three hours I had an experience with the Lord where I I was receiving waves of things from God that I couldn't even compute and understand. I was just praying, God, help me to know what you're giving me. And I walked out to go and uh, I had already fed the horses that morning, had a couple of colts. And I walked out to turn them out of the stall. And they always came to, to meet me. And I reached up to pet them. Long story short, there was no wind blowing. There was nothing happening. But all of a sudden, the Colts freaked one world, kicked me in the face. 
I, I just remember flying backwards and thinking, I think I got kicked. Dislocated my jaw, ripped my mouth all up, kicked out several of my teeth, knocked me out. I don't know how long I was out because no one was there. And when I woke up, the horses were long gone and it, and I had to just go in and hold my jaw up and drive myself to town. And, and, uh, what I didn't know was that it, it, uh, they, they said if, if the hoof had gone just a fraction, fraction to, uh, closer to one area, it would have hit an arter, artery there and I would have bled out in, in, in minutes. And, uh, nobody would even known until the buzzards, they saw the buzzards because nobody was around. And uh, and I don't think that is coincidence. I think that I was getting a revelation of what God is about to release in the earth. And the devil, sure enough, tried to take me out and kill me right then, had it not been for the grace of God. Let me hurry. I want to finish this, uh, this part. In Romans chapter 4, it says... Uh, and, and as it is written, I have made thee, talking about Abraham, a father of many nations, before him who believed, even God, who quickens the dead, makes alive the dead, makes alive the dead, and calls those things which be not as though they were, who against hope, Abraham, who against hope, believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body. He did not consider what his body looked like. Now dead, when he, he, couldn't, he couldn't produce children anymore. Part of his body could not produce anymore. He would not consider that. When he was about a 100 years old, neither did he consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief and was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Just because he believed God. Now, listen to this. It was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him who raised up Jesus, our Lord, for the, from the dead. Now, you can put that off into heaven if you want. But where they got restored was, was, wasn't in heaven. They got restored here on earth. And when the angel told uh, John Paul Jackson that there was a mystery, a secret in Romans chapter 4 that God was going to unleash in our time, I, I agree with Justin Paul Abraham. That's it right there. Because the covenant heads got fully, fully Restored. God did it another time. Remember when Moses went up in the mountain and he was with the Lord for 40 days and he was in the glory for 40 days? Okay, look at this. He's coming for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. That is not a religious word. That is uh, the glory is the kabod, the, the weightiness, the, the, the presence of God where the curse cannot get near it, can't even come close. So Moses goes up in the mountain. He's standing in the glory of God. He's not even, and he comes out of there glowing. He comes out of there lit up like a Christmas tree and glowing and his, but the glory faded on him and the Bible says that that's the old covenant and we're in the new and we're going from glory to glory our glory won't fade all right but why did he have the glory and what did it do it says later on that when God took him he had to kill Moses at 120 years old because he wasn't going to die because it said the moisture in his skin had not abated. In other words, his skin was still fresh. His eyes, it says, was still good and his strength was still sound. His body got restored. Of course it got restored because how can you, how can any curse or any, any evidence of, of the curse and sin uh, stand in the presence of the glory of God. It can't. So when the glory of God comes upon a people, oh, and the Bible says that his resting place shall be glorious. Well, look, I want to be his resting place. 
when Jesus said foxes have nests, uh, have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head or rest his headship. But that was before he uh, paid for salvation. But now I'm born again. I'm saved and I am the temple of the Holy Ghost. And he wants a place to rest. And he said his resting place will be glorious. And he said the glory on the latter house will be far greater than the former. He's not just talking about a brick and stone and, and, and gold covered building. He's talking about the tabernacle that he will raise up. He said he will raise up David's tabernacle, which is a, is a symbol of us, our bodies, our tents. He's going to glorify our bodies on this earth and redo. It's going to hair lip the devil, y'all. I hope you enjoyed this. I want to talk about this more later. Thank you and God bless you. Crystal Lyons, Calgary Logic. Thank you.